This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to build your beautiful online presence and run your business. Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here, and oh wow, do we have a lot to share this week. Loads of updates at Boca Chica, especially with the ground support equipment systems, other exciting events outside Starbase as well, with SpaceX's CRS-23 mission sending cargo to the International Space Station yet again. But this time we have the very first use of the new drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas, an eventful first launch for Firefly Alpha. We also had Astra's sideways launch creating a bit of a buzz, and some other interesting updates that you may have missed as well. So this has actually been a really interesting week in Boga Chica. Not the crazy push on prototypes we've seen in recent months, but some very focused development in several areas. If you're unfamiliar with this story due to being here for the first time, SpaceX are constructing and will soon be launching the largest rocket ever built, with the aim for it to also be fully reusable. Once SpaceX's goals here are achieved, that'll be an unprecedented and groundbreaking shift for the entire space industry. This is Ship 20 and Booster 4, currently separated, but will soon be combined once again to form the full stack. SpaceX is now preparing the launch site at Boca Chica to send this beast on its very first mission. In order to do this though, the ground support systems at the launch site still need to be completed. Just over the last few months, we've seen the colossal launch tower grow into the sky, and the pad that sits beside it being constructed for this record-breaking rocket to sit on. The progress continued on this during the week. Right after our last update, the ship quick disconnect arm was connected to the Lieber 11350 crane, lifted up and flipped upright. Sunday morning, the entire arm was lifted up and installed onto the side of the tower. Thanks to the terrific Boca Chica Gal and NASA spaceflight, we can see all of this in exquisite quality. It only took a few hours before the straps connecting the arm to the crane were then released, leaving the arm free on its own. The actuator used to extend and retract the arm was later attached to the arm itself, and the first test was soon underway. As the name of this structure suggests, the Quick Disconnect, or QD arm, will hold an umbilical that will temporarily attach to the side of the ships. Via this system, the ship will be linked to ground support networking and power systems, and SpaceX will transfer the liquid methane and liquid oxygen from the orbital propellant farm to the ship. Now, I suspect they will also want to do a full cryogenic pressure test using liquid nitrogen as well, so we'd expect other consumables to be fed through the arms during various stages of the testing campaign. Not so long ago, of course, SpaceX planned to transfer the propellant from the fuel farm to the ship via extra piping through the booster itself. That would have meant that there was no need for the QD arm as we now see it. However, this would have added more mass to the booster, therefore reducing the payload capacity to orbit. As of late, Elon has been stressing that the launch pad itself, which he calls Stage Zero, is even more complex and difficult than the Starship. Offloading as many systems as possible onto the launch site helps to keep the ship simpler and lighter. Now, there is a hidden benefit to this new QD arm as well. It is now designed to help stabilize the booster while the ship is being stacked on top via the massive arms, which could be mounted very soon. Elon reiterated this week that SpaceX are going to try to catch the largest ever flying object with robot chopsticks. I just love the little added success is not guaranteed, but excitement is part of that tweet. Excitement will certainly be expected regardless of this outcome. Now, there is a little skepticism out there about this, of course, and it may not initially go to plan, but wow, will it be incredible seeing this scene in the future. Just think back a little to how many people kept telling us that it was impossible to land a rocket booster. It is incredible what we can achieve if we just give it a try. Those two chopstick arms are now in the final stages of fabrication ahead of joining the QD arm on the tower. Once the arms are mounted, this will finalize the major components of the Mechazilla system to be used for stacking and catching of the vehicles. The installation onto the launch tower should take place this month, allowing for checkout operations ahead of being put into operation. Now, because this first orbital flight with boost Booster 4 and Ship 20 will not be returning to land or to be caught, I suspect the arms will only be used to stack the vehicle ahead of the flight. Either that, or they could of course do it manually via the cranes as seen just weeks ago. Speaking of the cranes, it also appears that we have a new SpaceX branded crane on the way as well. Max here on Twitter.
Twitter just so happened to catch this on the German Autobahn the other day. Quite the interesting find. It isn't every day you see SpaceX gear in Germany. When suggesting this looked like part of a future transport vehicle for getting Starship to the launch pad, Elon replied confirming that this is indeed SpaceX's new crane. That is exciting to see. He also mentioned in a tweet this week that hopefully the first try of the catching system will be with Booster 5. Now he also added once again that the booster has two pins for lifting and catching, although he has also said that it may be better to modify grid fins to take more load. Now those two pins that Elon was talking about here were actually already used on Booster 4 for lifting purposes. These mount points are going to be used to take the load of the colossal booster. At this stage though, I'd expect to see these to be longer and more evolved on the next booster prototypes, which would make them a little more forgiving in the accuracy requirement. Keep in mind that if the booster wobbles only a few centimetres off course, tank walls might bump into the catching arms before the pins come to rest. But what about the catching of the ship itself? How is that going to work? Well, we have a little hint here, and to me this sounds like something that is still in the process of being designed. For lifting and catching of the ship, something is going to need to flip out from the leeward side. Whether that load point could be a part of the forward flaps or a separate arm just underneath, I don't know, but we'll come back to you as soon as we see any more information on it. It definitely can't land on the flaps directly because those heat shield tiles would crumble instantly. More interesting is the way that the arms will rotate and line up the booster and ship correctly to stack. This is a very precise process and the arms are going to need to do all of this with the exact same accuracy that we see when manually done via the expert crane operators and support crew. When asked how the arms will slide the booster back out to line up with the orbital pad, Elon responded saying that there would be tank treads on the arms. We can only assume that this means that there will be some sort of conveyor belt that will sit on top of each arm frame that we've seen it being constructed recently. This is certainly certainly news that I've been waiting for. We knew that the arms can raise and lower along the vertical axis via a trolley system and that the arms can swivel left and right for alignment during a catch, but what we didn't know was how the booster would translate back and forth to provide the next degree of alignment control. Oh, here on Twitter has been working on scenarios that demonstrate how this could be constructed, but we're waiting for parts to show up to really have a good idea on this. It's very interesting all the same. Now on Tuesday morning, the Ground Support Equipment or GSE Tank 7 was rolled out of the build site and onto Highway 4. It slowly made its way to the launch site arriving a few hours later and in the afternoon it was lifted onto the orbital launch tank farm making it 6 out of 7 tanks now that were in place. Meanwhile, the small GSE 4 tank which was put through its cryo test last week was moved back to the build site. Just over the last day, another cryo shell made its way to the launch site as well. This is a fairly up to date photo of the GSE tank situation as it currently stands from the latest flight by RGV. There is just so much going on all the time at Boca Chica and covering all this every Saturday with you is such a thrill. Really appreciate you watching and following this with us. All that interaction lets us do what we do and in fact the whole community loves you for it. Just take this terrific video put live just yesterday by Cosmic Perspective launching the first episode in their Road to Mars series. This lets us relive the Starship excitement with unseen footage just incredible work there by Ryan and Mary Liz. Thanks so much for being a part of Team Space and doing what you do to like, subscribe and share creator content. I've got links in the description for this as well, so please do check that out when you can. So Ship 20 remains at Pad B with work continuing on fixing and replacing the thermal protection system tiles. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but just quickly a huge thank you to Squarespace today for their support of this video. Squarespace has been a massive help supporting what we do here on the channel, and I've used the platform a great deal myself. It's essentially a super simple all-in-one platform to build your online presence, which you can use for promoting yourself and what you do, or your company and brand if that's what you need. The great thing is that you can very rapidly try new ideas and completely new styles without any substantial time commitment or effort. You can just pick up a template that suits the style that you're after and drop in some sample content. Don't like it as much as you imagined? Just try a different template. There are so many to select from. Once you've settled on it, you can then customize it even more by adjusting fonts, colors, and graphics, and in just a few hours you can have a beautiful website structure all ready for your awesome content.
A great feature that I've been finding useful is the email campaign systems included, which allows you to effectively build up and communicate with your followers. Just like with the website tools offered, there is also an email layout for your target audience to get you started. You can also instantly support your cause with the easily integrated funding options provided by the inbuilt PayPal, Apple Pay and Stripe integration. If you want to check it out for yourself, just head to squarespace.com slash marcushouse and save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. You'll find that link in the description below. So yes, here is Ship20 at Pad B with work continuing on those TPS tiles. As seen before, hundreds of colour markers were placed on certain tiles, similar to those seen during the shuttle era with the tiles on the orbiter's belly. Over the past week especially, the amount of markers is clearly now being reduced. So the tile replacement efforts continue ahead of its first cryoproof test expected very soon. Thanks to this incredible high definition shot from RGV aerial photography, we can see all of this in incredible detail via their Patreon. Beautiful work there, Mauricio. So at the build site in the coming days, Booster 4 is expected to depart the high bay to return to the launch site for its testing campaign as well. The vehicle has been undergoing minor plumbing and wiring work during its time in the high bay, which now seems to have concluded with reinstallation of its Raptor engines. What still seems to be missing though is the covers for the engine plumbing. So far we haven't seen any indicators for this. So the even bigger question on everyone's mind, when is this going to launch? Well, sadly, that question remains a little elusive. The key indicators really come down to the initial pressure tests and static fires for both Booster 4 and Ship 20, the completion of ground support equipment, especially the GSE tanks and tower propellant systems, and of course, approvals from the FAA. Hopefully, we'll get some updates on all of this very soon. Alright, so finally we got to see a new Falcon 9 launch the other day as well. SpaceX was set to launch the Crew Supply Mission CRS-23 to the International Space Station on Saturday the 28th of August. However, the weather put a stop to those plans. Of primary concern on the day, of course, was the surrounding lightning strikes. The next day on Sunday the 29th, we were back at Pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center. The weather still didn't look perfect, but not enough of a worry to halt the launch this time. The late loading of sensitive science payloads was completed as planned and the capsule readied for flight. With around 2,200 kilograms or 4,800 pounds of science and supplies on board for this mission, the 23rd resupply for NASA was underway. With a precise launch time at 3.14am and 48 seconds, the Falcon 9 booster roared to life, sending the Cargo Dragon on its way. Terrific shots from Greg Scott on site as well, the darkness there allowing him to capture that amazing exhaust plume. Nice work there, Greg. A beautiful dark ascent of course to main engine cutoff, nothing much out of the ordinary there, but after stage separation just check out the beautiful interactions with the exhaust plume from the first and second stages there. That just looked incredible from the ground as well, with this great shot by Chris G on the NASA spaceflight feed. Nice work there tracking all of that Chris. The second stage pushed onwards for orbital insertion while we witnessed the booster make its landing attempt. This makes the 90th successful landing and the first for the drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas, which is the newest drone ship addition to the SpaceX fleet. After this booster was returned, SpaceX pulled some terrific clean landing footage right off it. There we go there, a 100% success rate so far for this new drone ship. A quick shout out to Stephen Marr as well, picking up some incredible aerial shots of it coming back into port. So after all of the booster excitement, we saw the typical second stage engine cutoff and separation of Cargo Dragon as it began to then chase down the International Space Station. Fast forward around 30 hours or so and we see here the Cargo Dragon on its final approach to the docking port of the International Space Station's Harmony module. Here it joined the Crew 2 Dragon which is scheduled to return to Earth early to mid-November, along with Cygnus 16, Soyuz MS-18 and Progress 78. It is busy up there, congratulations yet again SpaceX with another perfectly executed mission. In other Dragon updates, we of course are all desperately awaiting to see news on Inspiration4, which will certainly be the event of the month. Just check out these new photos shared here by Jared of the new cupola, which is now part of the Dragon Resilience vessel. This is going to provide amazing views of Earth while on the mission. I just can't wait to see all of the photos and videos from this view. Tony Bella here creating terrific renders to celebrate this upcoming mission as well. As far as we know, this is all set to launch on the 15th of September, just a little over a week. Take away now. 
Now also we had the very interesting Astra launch this week as well. Our friends at NASA Spaceflight beautifully covered their third orbital launch attempt from Kodiak Island in Alaska early in the week. On board this vehicle was the first ever test payload belonging to the US Department of Defense's space test program. There was an initial delay to the mission to allow for more time for propellant loading and software configuration updates, but soon we were watching the final countdown. Astra's 13 meter or 43 foot tall rocket ignited its five Delphin first stage engines, but less than a second after liftoff, one of those engines failed, leaving the thrust to weight ratio at about one. I mean, kudos there to the little guidance computer that could. The launch vehicle took a controlled slew sideways to show up once again through the smoke like a phoenix from the ashes. In just a few moments, the engines had burned through enough propellant to lower the total mass of the vehicle and have it steadily climb once again. With orbit being the goal for this mission, this outcome was a little disappointing as the vehicle could never make it there with an engine loss this early. However, all data is good data and at this point the objective became simply reaching max Q, which they did some two and a half minutes later. As the vehicle passed through the zone just above 30 kilometers, the engines were shut down with ground control issuing the command to safely terminate the flight. It's always sad of course to see a mission not achieve its primary objective, but the team at Astra will be working closely with the FAA to investigate what happened before making the necessary corrections supported by the mountain of data to review. It must have been the week for news on small rocket launches because Firefly Alpha launched for the very first time this week too. This is a 29 meter or 95 foot rocket launched on Thursday this week, all being streamed by Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. Big congratulations there Tim on being asked to do that by the way, it was great to have your enthusiasm for the countdown. The first attempt for the launch was aborted in the final seconds of the countdown, but it wasn't over for the day. They then went for a second attempt within that same four hour launch window. The Firefly Alpha rocket is stated to be capable of shooting up around one metric ton to orbit. This was their very first launch attempt heading up to a 300 kilometer retrograde, 137 degree inclination orbit. Quite an interesting choice there. I'm not sure if there is a specific reason for that inclination or whether it was just to demonstrate straight capability. Sadly of course the rocket never made it to main engine cutoff with it suddenly veering off course and exploding. Jack and Michael from NASA Spaceflight here capturing some great shots of the explosion from the ground as well. So yes not ideal but best of luck to Firefly Alpha combing through all that data to diagnose everything. There were many phases of the flight though that were successful and actually it was quite impressive for a first flight to go this well. Can't wait to see the next attempt. Now as Starship development continues rapidly, other companies are trying to keep up. The German rocket factory Augsburg, or RFA for short, just recently showed us their successful burst test. Like SpaceX, RFA plans to use stainless steel for most of their rocket. This is a small satellite launch vehicle with the first launch planned in 2022. Given Blue Origin's plans to also use steel for Jarvis, we are starting to see a pattern here now, aren't we? The RFA-1 is advertised to be capable of delivering 1.6 tons of payload to the International Space Station. That is far more than Rocket Lab's Electron or Virgin Orbit's Launcher 1 just as a quick comparison. But what makes RFA's launcher stand out a bit is that they're going to use stage combustion for their engines. So far I think only Launcher, a US based company, has developed engines with the same cycle for small satellite launches. Staged combustion means higher specific impulse and more payload to orbit. While Launcher's lead developer has worked many years in the Ukrainian rocket industry, RFA has chosen the path of long term cooperation with Yushmash to gain the valuable insights that they now have for their partially 3D printed engines. They actually build part of the first stage of the Antares just as an example. So far the cooperation is looking very beneficial since RFA did some promising hot fire tests of their engine just recently. A quick shout out as well to Mo, who is a German space YouTuber who allowed us to use his RFA factory tour video material. Thank you there for helping us out, links to Mo's channels are in the description. Now just a quick update on the space launch system as well this week. According to Eric Berger with Ars Technica, the first launch of the SLS with Artemis 1 may well now slip into spring of 2022 or beyond. Due to the space agency already running about two months behind, a launch this year seems very unlikely. Before the stacking of the Orion capsule and the launch escape system, NASA needed to install a mass simulator on top of the upper stage. This was needed for vibration tests which are going on right now. They had 
had planned to be finished in July, but this is taking much longer than expected it seems. After this step, the capsule installation might need tweaks as well, and then an entire wet dress rehearsal is planned which includes rolling out the rocket, filling it, detanking it, and then rolling it back in for final checkouts. If all of that goes to plan, a launch in spring 2022 might be possible, but given the occasional problem here and there, summer 2022 might be more likely. So yes, that was quite the eventful week, and hey, thanks so much here for watching all the way through and liking the content. That really helps to show all of those stat bots out there that this has been valuable content for you. It's such an honor here to have you amazing subscribers watching along to follow this all with me. Over the course of the last few years, our entire world has been dramatically changed. It's just so bizarre to be a little piece of your lives, and I'm incredibly grateful to all of you. Not only for that, of course, but also for being amazing patrons or YouTube members supporting what we do or to anyone picking up merch from our store below. There's loads of designs with or without logos or text, all available on many different types of clothing and products. No matter how that anyone is supporting out there, know that it all certainly allows us to increase what we're capable of doing. If you'd like to join us more directly, you can join up as a YouTube member via the join button below, or you can become a patron at patreon.com slash Marcus House. Either of those options gives you access to chat with us via our elevated roles on the Discord server. You can also have your names listed right here like these other terrific people. And you can also get earlier and ad-free access to the videos to watch before anyone else. If you are interested in these topics and you'd like to keep up to date, follow me on Twitter at Marcus House as well. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video from last week. In the top right is the latest video. And in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from the channel just for you. Thank you everybody for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.